this is the one I was looking for because this is the big hurdle. The environmental impact assessment report, uh, which was filed last year, is probably the, the most important document. The government actually uh, had reviewed it and uh, approved it. This is a stamp of approval, not only by the government of the province, but also by the local community. Nature investment is always looking forward. We've got to look forward. So what else needs to happen? Well, welcome to Crooks Investor. First of all, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like it, give us a thumbs up at the end. Much appreciated. And do leave your comments below because it helps us understand the sorts of questions you think we should be asking, how you think we've done, and of course, what you thought of the company. And of course, you can uh, get this as a podcast or read about it on an article or transcription on cruxinvestor.com. And of course, for Crux Club members, you get early access to this video. And if you haven't already done so, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for for more videos like this, click the notification bell. We spoke earlier today to Farhad Abazov, who's the CEO of Millennial Lithium. It's a story we've been following for some time. We've done a few interviews with uh, Farhad. Quite smart individual, been there, done it. Track record is pretty impressive. Made a lot of money for a lot of people along the way. Um, lithium market, been in the doldrums for the last two years, but this is one of the most advanced lithium projects. It's a brine. They've just today announced the fact that the DIA has approved their EIA, and which was the kind of last and major hurdle that they needed to get over a few little permits, kind of functional type permit things to, to do, but uh, that's just kind of in the works at the moment. And we talked to them about how they, what they're up to, because we discussed previously about um, some DD being done by strategic partners uh, looking at this project. It's quite attractive, lowest quartile uh, producer. Um, Argentina is open for business again, it seems, um, and uh, you know, uh, you know, Farhad's quite keen to kind of, you know, show people that uh, their project is shovel ready, ready to go. Uh, share price in the doldrums um, hasn't uh, attained its dizzy heights of three, four years ago. I think there's potential f uh, for that to happen here once the funding uh, takes place. So uh, take a look in the description below at the various topics we discuss. We get into the macro a little bit. Anything interests you in particular, click on the timestamp beside that topic. I'll jump you to that part of the video. Otherwise, enjoy what Farhad has to say. Farhad, how are you doing, sir? Very well, thank you, Matt. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, all good. We're all good here. I'm loving that background. Where's that? Oh, thank you very much. That's that's in Baku, Azerbaijan. <laughs> very nice. It's absolutely gorgeous. Look, so I want to be there. Yeah, yeah, you should. You should. Once COVID restrictions are lifted, though. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I, I I have actually seen I've seen a, seen a few programs. Uh, I think it's been quite quite a few movies shot there as well. It's uh, it's a fa fantastic city. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right, gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, we should talk Fast about and Furious, some other movies. There you go, <laughs> the, all the good, all the good <laughs> movies. Well, we should talk about your press release today because we spoke recently, and you said this was coming up. Um, you said it would be quick, and it clearly is. You've 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 got a little bit of news around the EIA today, so just talk us through that and what it means. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. So. You remember last time we spoke, I think it was a few weeks back, um, I mentioned that EIA was in the pipeline and there were a lot of questions, you know, after the presidential elections and provincial elections that took place in October last year as to how the new government was going to approach mining energy uh, sectors and uh, what it will mean in reality, you know, when it comes to actual permitting process. And it was, and you remember I told you that, you know, although the government, um, you know, changed in Salta as well, the new president came in at the provincial level, the new minister of mining and so forth, but they immediately um, expressed their full support for uh, almost all mining uh, projects and specifically to our project, our Pastas Grandes project in, in Salta. And, uh, and today um, they made that announcement that uh, the government actually uh, had reviewed it and uh, approved it. And the, which opens the doors to um, basically completing the entire permitting process. So the, the environmental impact assessment report, uh, which was filed last year, is probably the, the most important document because that encapsulates all our plans, all our uh, production plans, construction plans, as well as all the conversations, all the interaction and consultations with, uh, with the local community, with the government and so forth. And of course, as the name implies, it takes, you know, it really looks at the environmental impact of our project, of our, uh, um, of our production center on, on, the, um, on the environment in Salta province and in, in Pastos Grande specifically. So um, I must say that, uh, you know, this is a stamp of approval, not only by the government of uh, uh, the province, but also by the local community, uh, because uh, it actually shows 
they, you know, the, the environmental and benign character and nature of this business model of this approach in terms of using solar evaporation ponds. We're not going to really disturb the environment uh, that much at all, as you know, there's no, uh, you know, uh, much of a uh, excavation or earth moving in general. Um, we just drill into the uh, uh, ore body or into, in this case into brine reservoirs and pump brine back up to the surface. So all of that actually shows that, you know, we're, we're on the right track. The government is on the right track and it sends a very strong message to the investment community, which was a bit um, nervous uh, about, uh, you know, how the new government will behave, uh, you know, how the new government will actually treat some of these large mining and energy projects in the country, specifically in Salta province. But we've always said, look, the Salta province is one of the strongest supporters of business, specifically mining. And, uh, and you know, fortunately, they proved it. They put the money uh, where their mouth is, so to speak, in terms of approving the CIA. For me, following our last conversation, this is the one I was looking for, because this is the big hurdle. Because as you say, it says that you've done things right, legitimately. Uh, obviously, the involvement of the stakeholders locally, I, you know, I would have needed to see that, and that's clearly that sound. But as you say, the big signal is to the market about the intent of the Argentinian government about mining and doing business and, and you know, international partners being in Argentina. So that was, that's what I was looking for, and I'm, I'm glad you've achieved that. Um, but let's look forward now, because it, like, <laughs> nature investment is always looking forward. We've got to look forward. So w what else needs to happen now? Because we, we talked previously about people in doing due diligence and potentially you know looking at funding partners, and you need to find the right structure there for you and your shareholders. But what's, what, what needs to happen between now now you've got the CIA approval and being able to make a decision as to which partner to go with. Any more permits, licenses? So, man, maybe I can tell you in a nutshell, uh, you know, what we've been doing while all these COVID restrictions have been in place and, you know, what we're planning to do um, continuing into this uh, situation, into this lockdown situation in Argentina specifically, so that uh, both yourself and, of course, the listeners and viewers can appreciate what we've been doing despite all these uh the kind of constraints placed on us by external uh, circumstances. So first of all, in addition to the EIA approval, we also consolidated our land position. So in other words, you remember we've been working on Remsa properties, these are uh, the properties that we've acquired from um, the government of, our, uh, of Salta uh, through tender process. We had big work commitments on, the, uh, on these properties, which we've completed and we've paid the government to completely uh, transfer these titles to um, uh, to Millennial, so now Millennial actually owns and controls all of these properties, all of the all of this land position in Pastos Grandes. That is very important because we've achieved it again in the middle of all this pandemic uh, mayhem going on worldwide. Um, in addition to this, um, the work on the ground continues, despite again all the constraints, despite all the uh, difficulties there and challenges with shifts and so forth. We continue to work there. We, we, we are completing the work on the community center that we've been building. Obviously, the uh, pilot operations have been continuously ongoing. And that's very important because we haven't really slowed down any of the uh, plans, any of the programs that we set out to accomplish, despite, again, as I said, all this um, uh, potential delays and, and issues. Now, going forward, uh, we realize, look, I mean, um, no, nobody knows when all of these restrictions will be uh, lifted. So we have to continue um, with our track, with our programs, and specifically now getting the rest of the permits, um, which is mostly mechanical. I mean, I, I don't want to uh, minimize their importance, but I want to say that they, most of them are operational permits, such as getting export licenses, you know, construction licenses, and so forth, uh, from both the provincial, uh, federal, and municipal governments. Um, but you know, we've been working on it already. In other words, we were not just waiting for EIA to approve it and then launch uh, you know, the programs in that regard. So that has been going on. So, and they will be um, received as we go forward. In other words, uh, they're not going to be major obstacles for any of the work that uh, we we're planning to accomplish in the next few months. Now, the key thing right now, Matt, as you know, uh, we're at a stage where we need to um, uh, basically secure funding for this project. So we're facing interesting options right now. Again, despite the COVID situation, we, we've been uh, continuously um, discussing and negotiating with various parties who are interested and becoming our strategic partners or just large investors in the project. Um, so we're looking at various options right now. One is actually uh, going forward with this project with a, with a very large strategic partner uh, who would come and basically help us 
fund this using our current technology, our current approach. Um, then there are a couple of other large um, companies, and uh, not necessarily in lithium space, but they're in energy space, uh, who are very much interested in becoming large players in the sector, in lithium sector. And they've developed uh, variations of, um, of you know, extraction, lithium extraction technologies that they would like to basically kind of uh, bring in into what we've been doing in Saltec. Uh, so we're looking into that as well. Um, now, the rationale behind this, Matt, is to look at all these three options, I would say, because those two companies have two different approaches and see what will work best for us in terms of funding. And when I say funding, it's not just availability of financing, but also what kind of shareholder dilution we're going to have as a result. Um, what are, which one of these projects or sorry, technologies will actually get us to production faster and at what cost? Um, and of course, you know, the most important thing also is that the, the size of this. I mean, the, do we have to scale this down a little bit to start with or we'll just go ahead with our uh, original plan, which was basically starting with about 10, 12,000 tons and then ramping up to about uh, to full 24,000 tons of lithium carbonate production per year, two years after the start. So luckily, all of these options are still on the table. And um, the way we're, we've, we've been approaching this is that, look, uh, while we're kind of all sitting in our, our homes, uh, we can con continue discussing all these things, both internally and with these parties, so that when the, you know, the, the market opens up, the economies open up, and the, the restrictions are listed, we can basically bring all of this to conclusion. In other words, do your own DD on all these things and make a decision so that when the time comes, we let's say in September, October, hopefully, uh, we'll make an announcement as to how, which way we're going to go and what kind of a uh, structure, be it strategic partnership, joint venture, or just uh, straightforward investment, um, we will be able to put together. So, so I think, again, uh, the fact that we, we've accomplished so much despite all these restrictions, the fact that we still have um, a healthy cash position um, uh, will position us in a very, uh, you know, very favorably compared to a lot of our peers uh, come the, uh, the recovery time. Because um, we think we're at a stage and with a low cost structure that usually Brian projects have, whereas we'll be able to attract significant investment interest um, so that we can actually get going with construction. Okay, so you're, you're pretty close to being shovel ready. You've got to get the money, in, the right type of money in place. I know you've got a, a lot right. of people sniffing around here and doing diligence and so forth. So it begs the question then, what's happening in the world of lithium? The lithium macro environment, I, I'm sure like, a lot of uh, commodities is struggling at the moment to try and understand what the, the new world's going to look like post COVID. So, what's what's your take on that? And and I appreciate you're the you know low, lowest quartile cost producer, and you know so it's all kind of good from that point of view. But people got to get work out the timing on this, you know. And you're I guess you know the, the biggest upside you can see is if the lithium market comes back. Um, and you know, it's full swing, and the you know the EV thematic isn't impacted too greatly by COVID. So, how, how are you and the board managing that, or trying to work out what the future looks like? So, Matt, I mean, uh, this is uh, you know probably one of the most important factors that will affect whatever we do in the next few months, obviously. And I mean, if you look at the situation pre-COVID, um, you know, I'm talking about at least you know 18 months back up to let's say March of this year. Um, we've seen uh, quite a gloomy picture in, um, in the sector, um, you know, oversupply, uh, the price coming down. Um, the one bright spot in the whole kind of scenario and the whole uh, uh, landscape was actual continuous growth in the, uh, in the demand for, uh, for electric vehicles, hence obviously for all kinds of battery materials. So that has been in place. In other words, that's the most important, I would say, um, factor in the whole Kind of dynamics is that you know the, the the strong forecast or strong growth forecast has been actually um you know uh, true or holding true i should say in the last few months especially pre-covid i mean if you look at the numbers um you know ev sales have jumped dramatically in western europe well, at least in major european countries like uk france italy and germany you know year on year the first quarter they went up by almost 90 percent specifically evs right so um, now, the expectation and my personal belief is that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, after recovery starts, probably that type of a trend will, will return. I think it will, again, obviously people are not going to rush out to buy cars, but when they do go out to buy cars, 
<clears throat> it will be electric vehicles mostly. Uh, at least they will do better than uh, you know uh, regular regular cars. Now, in terms of its impact on lithium, <clears throat> I think you know there have been quite a few interesting uh, developments in the lithium space as well. Obviously, uh, you know related to the fact that there was an oversupply and still oversupply, by the way, in, in the sector, and the lithium price has come down. Now, it is a typical feast and famine situation now, whereas. You know, the lithium price has come down to about $5,500, $6,000 per ton. This is on a spot price basis. And um, a lot of high cost producers are already feeling the squeeze. So, so we've seen not only, uh, you know, hard rock producers um, in, you know, out of Australia and China, you know, basically feeling the pain and, you know, either scaling down their production or shutting it down altogether. But a lot of development projects getting shelved. Right, because they're looking at it. If their cost structure is pretty high, they're saying, "Well, I mean, it, there's no way for us to actually get it funded." Um, so they're, they're getting shelved. Some of them getting it canceled altogether indefinitely. Um, so that actually, I think, will have an interesting um, uh, dynamic or interesting impact on the whole, um, you know, the, the price the, the scenario going forward. Because what's going to happen is that when you have almost half of the world's supply coming from hard rock producers who actually have higher uh, operating costs than, let's say, brine producers, and where the price of lithium is already below their uh, marginal cost of production. Either the price has to be pushed up to that level so that they still stay in business, or they have to go out of business. Um, so I think that will bring to the, the, the whole you know, the supply demand the dynamic into a more stable or more balanced situation where the price will have to come up once those guys either you know go belly up or they you know uh, or something else happens there, whereas the price is at a level where it incentivizes new investments. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that um, you know the brine projects, for example, and our projects specifically, um, you know, tend to have much lower operating costs. So, for example, we expect to produce about thirty-four hundred dollars per ton. So today, you know, if we were to produce today and sell it at, at spot price. You know, we'd still make money. However, that may not be enough to cover all your capex and so forth. So that's why I think in the next few months, probably you know, again the third or fourth quarter of this year, we're going to see that type of st stability in the price. And uh, it is absolutely important, and I think it's it will have to happen, Matt. Because if it doesn't, there's no way you know the industry can meet the demand coming from EVs. So, um, what form of shape it's going to take? Obviously, we can argue that, but but it will have to happen because right now, basically, you know, only few um, projects worldwide are still kind of uh, standing still up and uh, and alive. Uh, most of them are, you know, suffering. Um, either they completely bankrupt or they, you know, they decided to abandon their projects or um, they're, they're on their knees uh, for, you know, for, for, you know, basically start for cash. Um, uh, that's why I think, you know, the companies that are in stronger position We'll have to wait that moment when the recovery happens in the in, in the industry. Now, going back to your question as to the forecast, now if we were talking about this, you know, uh, in the first quarter of this year before COVID started, um, I would say probably by the middle of the of the year, by the middle of 2020, would have that type of recovery, meaning that you know, the, we would have turned the corner. Um, with this type of a delay, I think most likely we're looking at the third um, or fourth quarter of this year. Um, if the economy is open up, at least to you know quasi-normal, um, uh, you know conditions, um, and at that point, I think you know uh, we'll be in a position basically go and as I said, complete all these deals that we've been discussing and uh, basically complete the, the structure. Um, and um, as I think I mentioned last time, Matt, we're, we're not doing this on our own. We have a very strong uh, financial advisors, Credit Suisse. Their Toronto and the London offices are have been helping us. Uh, and um, another very important thing I should note here that despite the difficulties and challenges that the sector has been experiencing, and this is I'm talking about pre-COVID, uh, the parties that are talking to us are not short-term um, uh, speculative uh, groups. So these are large industrial groups that have already made a you know, long-term decision. And they have very strong vision that, look, this is what we want to be in. And, and they, you know, this is a long-term trend that we want to participate, not only participate, but we also want to become um, you know, significant players in the sector. So I think that is, that's very important for us because that's why the, this, you know, uh, this DD on their part, as well as, you know, the, all these detailed conversations continue to this day. 
Um, otherwise, we would have lost a lot of uh, interest, you know, probably in mid-2019. No, I think that's a really good point you raised. We've had first conversations with lithium groups and individuals over the past few weeks. And that's quite clear. The decision making for, you know, when you're certainly talking about EV, it's multi-year planning, you know, 10-year cycles for them. So if there's a if there's a dip in the market now, it doesn't really affect their planning. They are, because with automotives, uh, we looked at all of the automotive brands, it's $300 billion worth of infrastructure being uh, spent and, and built um, around that. So they are going to need the supply and it's going to come down to where where can they get that from, from a reliable source, you know, over a long period of time. And I guess the companies that can make money can get funded and they will survive and others yeah. will have to work out a different way or a different model of, of getting to market. Um, yeah, okay. Well, like, I th- thanks for the macro component there. It's always interesting yeah, getting a different right. different take and a different angle on it. But, um, well, like, Farhad, like, good news. Like I said, yeah, we were looking out for this one. This for us was a big one, big moment, hurdle to come over, overcome. Um, you've you've done it. Um, let's let's stay in touch. Let us know how these DD conversations get on, um, because you know picking the right partner is going to be really important for you. Really important. Well, thanks so much, Matt, and I, I'm, I'm glad you found time for, for this interview. I think it, uh, it will give a lot of information to your viewers.